Throughout the years, we've seen murder missing person cases time and time again. People who are there one day to suddenly vanish into thin air without a trace and lost their lives from being at the wrong place at the wrong time. It's a dreadful feeling and can cause people to lose their minds in trying to seek out information on what happened to their loved ones and friends. Most of the time, justice is rightfully served or a person is found, but in some cases, don't go any further than what little details are collected from the start. With the perpetrator still being out there walking amongst possibly new victims, or someone missing out in the cruelty of the world. It's a sad state of affairs when no word, evidence, or information is brought to light leading up to the events that transpired. A family suffering from a loss of a loved one and not getting closure has to be one of the most painful experiences to have. Today, I'm going to briefly go over five cold cases that have yet to be solved. Linda Holgerson Linda Holgerson was a 57-year-old woman who was mentally and physically handicapped. Her friends have stated that she was someone who had never made enemies and wouldn't get into cars with people she didn't know. Linda was last seen around 4.15 p.m. on October 19, 2007, outside of a Bank of America getting into a light or white-colored minivan off of Broadway near Henry Street in Kingston, New York. She was wearing a white puffy coat with a hood, light colored sweatpants, and dark colored sneakers. Unfortunately, on November 4, 2007, state police discovered Linda Holgerson's body in an overgrown embankment near some vacant seasonal homes in the Greene County town of Prattsville. A real estate agent was showing off property to some prospective buyers when they found Linda's body. An autopsy concluded that she was indeed murdered. With hundreds of investigations into Linda's death, nothing has yet to come of this horrible situation. Was it someone looking to take advantage of Linda's disabilities, or was it something else? Sonia Centino Sonia Centino was a 44-year-old woman living in the city of Poughkeepsie, New York. She was reported to have been last seen in the Main Street area of Poughkeepsie during the winter of 2006. Sonia was wearing a blue fleece Okimo ski zip-up, a dark colored tunic, and black high-heeled ankle booties. She also had a tattoo of a winged lion on her chest. On August 4, 2006, the New York State Police were dispatched to 123 Mountain Road in the town of LaGrange around 3.55 p.m. to investigate human remains that were discovered in a shallow grave. Two Dutchess County residents were taking a walk around Old Porter Farm when they found a human hand partially buried in the ground. The victim was positively identified as Sonia Centino. The investigation has also indicated that she was dead in the shallow grave for approximately three to seven months. So who murdered Sonia Centino? What happened that cold November night in Poughkeepsie? Megan McDonald Megan McDonald was a 20-year-old college student who was attending SUNY Orange Community College in Middletown, New York. She was just starting her life at such a young age, and she was described as being full of life and having a laugh that was contagious to everyone around her. While she was attending the school, she was also working at the Galleria Mall in Middletown as a waitress for the American Grill. On March 15, 2003, Megan McDonald's body was found in a muddy field off of Bowser Road in the town of Wallkill, New York. Evidence has shown that foul play was the cause and that she had suffered from blunt force trauma. A couple days later, her 1991 Mercury Sable GS was discovered parked at the Kensington Apartments in Middletown, New York. Days turned to weeks, weeks turned to months, months turned to years. Still, no further information has been brought to light on who committed the crime of this young college student. The family hasn't given up hope and continue to seek out the perpetrator who took their daughter away that cold March in 2003. The search for more information is not a sprint, but a marathon. While the case remains unsolved, the mother has a word for the persons involved. This is a great burden that you're carrying around. And 
And when you think about it, you've been carrying this secret around for the past 13 years. If you were to come to the police and give yourself up, you would feel so much better because that great weight would be lifted off your shoulder and that burden would be gone. And you'd finally be able to, to know that the secret, the terrible secret that you've been carrying around with you is now gone. And then you can move on from there. And you would be doing so many people a great service, not only the public and our family and friends, myself, but also for Megan, because Megan didn't deserve what happened to her. I'm hoping someday that Megan McDonald's family can find peace, and that this monster that's still on the loose will get the justice that they deserve. Now I find these first three cases fascinating, all of them spanning over a four-year period, from 2003 to 2007, and all within the same New York region. I'm not making any claims, but I wonder if they're linked in any way. Does this area of New York have a serial killer on the loose that's never been caught? With Middletown and Kingston only being one hour away from each other, and Poughkeepsie being in between the both of them, it's just odd to me. But I do hope they're able to find the perpetrators of these three unfortunate cases. Lutricia Steele Lutricia Steele was a 27-year-old woman from Schenectady, New York. Steele was faced with a troublesome childhood and was mostly raised in a foster care. As an adult, for a brief time, she worked at a and allegedly sold marijuana occasionally. She accused her youngest child's father of at the time, and his trial was to start in May of 2009, where she was supposed to testify against him. On May 1st at 2 p.m., Lutricia Steele was last seen leaving her home that she shared with her mother in the 1100 block of Webster Street in Schenectady, New York. And that day, she told her mother that she'd be back in two hours to pick her two youngest kids up to go to a barbecue. At that time, she did not have a vehicle. Steele ran some personal errands and cashed a check, but never returned home that day and was never heard from again. The day she disappeared, Steele told a friend of hers that she was pregnant and as she had a doctor's appointment that day to discuss how far along she was, she apparently never did make it to that appointment as well. With no contact and no sign of steel anywhere, the family grew concerned. They stated that it was never in her character to just up and abandon her kids. In April of 2009, about two weeks before she disappeared, Steele asked her half-sister to take care of her four children for a month. The half-sister said she would only help her out if she were given legal temporary custody of them. Steele refused and her brother offered to take the kids instead, with Steele turning him down. Unfortunately, with Steele missing, her children were split apart, with their two oldest kids going to the father and the two youngest kids going to the grandmother. Steele also had a prepaid cell phone that went missing with her. The police have tried contacting the phone numerous times with no answer, and no calls were made from the phone as well. Patricia Steele's case has yet to be solved. She has never been heard or seen from. Was this an act of a troubled childhood and mental state that caused her to leave without a trace? Or was it possibly someone out there trying to make sure that Steele was never to be heard from again? Suzanne Gloria Lyall Suzanne Gloria Lyall was a 19-year-old woman who was quiet and expressed herself through poetry. She was an avid fan of computers in the band Rush. In 1998, Suzanne attended the SUNY College in Albany, New York where she was studying computer science. She also worked part-time at Babbage's Software in the Crossgates Mall in Gilderland, New York. On March 2, 1998, Suzanne left work at around 9.20 p.m. and boarded a Capital District Transit bus near the mall. She exited the bus around 9.45 p.m. at the Collins Circle stop on the SUNY campus. Normally, Suzanne would call her boyfriend when she'd arrive back at her dorm room after work but he never heard from her that night. With it being an unusual sign, he attempted to get a hold of her for a while, but was unable to do so. There was no evidence of her coming back to the dorm room, and Suzanne was never seen again. With no sign or word from Lyle, a missing persons investigation went underway. Lyle's mother mentioned that Suzanne's relationship with her boyfriend was unhealthy, and she repeatedly tried to break up with him. Suzanne's boyfriend claimed that he was playing video games online with a friend at the time Lyle went missing. 
with a friend supporting his claim. But Suzanne's parents felt like he may have been involved in the case. They mentioned that although he only lived a short distance away from the campus, he never stopped to check in on her when she didn't answer his calls. Suzanne's co-worker also told the authorities that she had mentioned an unidentified man stalking her before March, but she didn't seem scared of the person. It's also not known if this stalker has any relation to the case. One of the creepy things about this case is Suzanne's ATM card was used by an unidentified person on March 3rd, 1998, the day after her disappearance. The ATM card was used to extract $20 at a steward shop on the corner of Manning Boulevard and Central Avenue, just shy of three miles from the SUNY Albany campus. Even though the person was unidentified, they used the correct pin first try. Two months after Suzanne's disappearance, her work name tag was discovered in an area adjacent to the visitor's parking lot at the SUNY College. The tag was approximately 30 yards from the Collins Circle bus stop. It's not known if Lyle lost the tag the night she went missing, but it appeared to have been exposed to the elements for a while. So what happened to Suzanne Gloria Lyle? Was this stalker the case of her disappearance? Was it her boyfriend? Or was there another motive behind her vanishing from everyone's existence? With the case still being unsolved, we may or may never know. The world can be a cruel place. You never know what the next day will bring. I'm hoping that justice and closure can come to these cases and that the family will find peace through it. Thank you for watching. Stay safe, and I'll see you in the next one.